What's up, everybody? Welcome to Mind Your Money, the show that highlights people and stories that will inspire you to get your money right. This week, I'm so beyond excited to have a conversation with Polomi Damani, who is the GM, the general manager at Credit Karma. And I, I can't tell you how excited I am to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you, Yanelli. I'm super excited to, to participate as well. Looking forward to all your sort of questions and, and insights around this. Of course. Well, I mean, I'm so excited because I feel like there's multiple aspects to this conversation that I don't get to have every day, right? Like one is you don't get to talk to women in the fintech space very often because it's so male dominated. And two is, you know, especially having a conversation with a woman of color who has, you know, an immigrant experience, which I think gives you such such a beautiful insight into an experience that is really can be challenging when it comes to money and finances. So being able to speak for that in fintech is so important um, as a daughter of immigrants. That's like, really close to my heart. So I am beyond, <laughs> beyond excited to have you today. Um, so I want you to kind of tell us about your professional path. Cause of course, you know, when you say a name like credit karma, people are like, wow, you must be, you know, working yeah. up there with the big shots in Silicon <laughs> Valley. Um, but I know that there's so much more that you've done and, and that you have this professional pathway that kind of led you to the work that you do today. So can you share some of that with us? Yeah, absolutely. You know, like a lot of um, immigrants that came to the United States, um, to for for college, um, so came here to study computer science, uh, and then you know, typically the, even though sort of computers and technology are now part of every business, you know, you kind of migrate to Silicon Valley uh, because that's where it's the mecca, right? Uh, you want to work in tech, you got to come to Silicon Valley. So that's what I did, and I worked with a you know started a couple of companies on my own, but also worked in sort of larger companies like Symantec and Yahoo, and really built that foundation of of knowledge and experience and, you know, just really being able to build uh, technology and consumer products that really talk to billions of people and hundreds of millions of people. And there's different challenges associated with that. Um, I was part of a startup that we, that uh, friends of mine had started, uh, which, which got sold. And right around that time, um, you know, got a call from the, um, the White House um, uh, to join this uh, little tech strategy group called the US Digital Service. Um, and, you know, I was sort of skeptical, like everybody else about it. But, but really, you know, when I, when I went to, into that, uh, that administration, the Obama administration really sort of opened up my eyes around how technology can be a force for good and a force for bad, right? Badly implemented or no solutions are keeping, you know, veterans from getting health care, immigrants from being able to come in legally into this country, you know, getting your social security check, being able to pay your, your taxes. How do we have that technology component built properly? Because if it's not built properly, it can really harm consumers, right? That's right. Um, it just won't work, like, right? It just won't yeah. work. You can't apply for anything. You can't get your paycheck. You don't get your social security. You know, right. there's just a bunch of stuff that you rely on the government for that. The technology is like old and dated, right? And so you saw that with healthcare.gov. Um, it was just, it was an eye-opening experience. Uh, and it really brought home this, notion that I had joined technology for this, the ability to impact people's lives. And when I came out of it, you know, I was held in on finding a company that would have that mission. I didn't want to just go back into kind of the traditional tech and got introduced to Credit Karma and just, you know, fell in love with the mission, this notion of, hey, how do we, um, you know, educate our consumers about their financial journey? You know, how do we help them get out of living from paycheck to paycheck to really getting into better credit history and, and being able to borrow properly and like saving for that home and saving for that car. Um, and it just felt like the right place for me, both from a mission perspective and my background in tech as well. So that's sort of the, the long and short of it, but super, super thrilled about where I am. That's awesome. It's, it's not every day you get to really connect those two things. You know, I feel like in my career path, I kind of had a similar moment where I decided I really want to conjoin personal finance and financial literacy education. Yes. Um, with what I was doing, which was teaching like it's, but in schools, there's not a lot of financial yeah. literacy. So I had to kind of do that in a unique way. And I, I really see that when you, where your pathway kind of resonates with me and that you're combining the um, mass impact, but also really thinking about the tools and the information that are actually going to get the job done. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and just on that note, no, you know, coming as an immigrant, I didn't know what a credit score was, you know, right. I had never opened a bank account before. And so just understanding the mechanics of money and inflows and spending and making your paycheck last and, you know, uh, just not getting into debt as a student. It was just, you, you, you know, you either learn from your friends and your family, you learn nowadays from, you know, uh, sort of 
podcasts and shows like yours, right? Yeah. A lot of younger folks reach out that way. They learn socially. Um, or, you know, you you hope for companies like Credit Commerce to teach you, right? That's so. right. I mean, I definitely got to say, when I started my YouTube channel, my very first video, it was about Credit Karma, or my first or second video, I talked about Credit Karma because it was 2014 when I first decided to pay off like, yeah. $20,000 of credit card debt. And I didn't, I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I remember signing up for credit karma. And that was the first time I'd ever seen the five credit factors. Yeah, like, exactly. Nobody was talking about that before credit karma. Nobody was putting them out there like that and saying, do you know what goes into your credit score? Here's the little pie. Here are the components. And oh, this totally. is what you have to do. It's like mind blowing now that it's, you know, we talk about like, oh, these are the factors of your credit. But at that time, like nobody knew this stuff. It was really right. kind of, you know, like just this information that was kind of hidden from us. Like we didn't know how our credit scores were developed. <laughs> exactly. So, it was a way for banks to score you. And this was kind of come up with that power of that information into the consumer's hands. So you can be like, oh, I think I have to pay down my debt in order for me to get, you know, into a, into a better home or a better, better car. Yeah. yeah, which makes it makes a lot of sense because when you're in college or when you're in school, you know, you have your, your uh, course syllabus that tells you what That's you right. need to do to get an A, right? Like, <laughs> what if the professors kept that a secret? Like, you didn't know, <laughs> you didn't know what you had to it's do. It's a to great get an analogy. A. It's like, we're doing what you need to do. We're going to figure out what your grade is in the background. But yeah, yeah, that's it'd be so yeah. bizarre. It'd be so bizarre. Um, so I, I really just love opening the podcast with some just like heartfelt conversations about like all the taboos around money. Like, let's just get that stuff yeah. out of the way, right? Because yeah. people don't like talking about it. There's so much shame around it. Um, and one of the, the biggest ones is, is financial regrets. So I yeah. like to start with that, right? Like, let's just put it out there. What's a, a, one of the biggest money regrets you've ever had? Maybe it's a purchase or an experience where you feel like you wish you could just go back in time and just undo that and not make that money mistake. I, I tell you that the first time, um, you know, early in my career when I got my paycheck and I had a little bit of, of money left over, I had a bonus. And I was really uh, wanting to take a trip um, uh, to Europe and I wanted to sort of fund myself. And so I thought, you know, I don't have enough right now, but I want to go right away. So I'll just play the stock market. Literally, how, what, what could wow. go wrong? I'm a smart person. I can figure this out, right? And so, and the, you know, I did the whole like, hey, let's go to social forums, see what people are talking about, which, which, which stock is up and I'll just bet on that. And you'd be, you'd be far safer going to Vegas and betting everything on your, on, 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 <laughs> on, on roulette, right? But, and it was just, and you, it, you just get sucked into it because you know, it's, it's sort of a high, you see the stock go up and then it goes down and you're just like, oh, I, I can make it up in volume and you just keep doing it. And, you know, needless to say, I couldn't make that trip because I'd, you know, taken my extra cash and kind of blown it on this. And that's when I realized, hey, you, these are things that are, that you need to learn, right? And there's, there's, and, and there's training wheels and apps and, and things that you need to like really look at and, and understand before you do that. So, that's yes. one regrettable mistake. I'm sure there will be others. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, there's never just one, right? But but yeah. I think that, that's such a good one because I think it's relatable for so many people today because oh, the stock sure. market has only, it's only, I think, become more of like a, a seems like what seems like a, a game than yeah. ever before, right? If, if, if at yeah. the time where you thought it was like a game, imagine now with all the apps, with all the trading platforms, with all the fintech stuff coming into the space, totally. making it feel even more you know, yeah. gamified, if, if right. there's not a better word, really gamified, um, which makes it more tempting, I think, for young people to jump in and quote unquote, play with it. Right. And, 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 you know, and you have to really think about, um, you know, how those, those apps kind of motivate you, right? So you have like, yeah. confetti and like, you know, progress, and there's like, oh, my God, referral, right? You know, and so yeah. there's a bunch of this kind of stuff where it's actually driving your dopamine level, right? That's and you want it, and this is not something that's like, it's not casual, you know, it's not a, you know, clicking on something, somebody's photo or anything like that, right? This is hard money that, you know, you, you don't get back. So one of the things we're doing, and I own um, a product line called Credit Karma Money. One of the things you want to do is take that kind of reward, be rewarding behavior and reward long-term good financial habits, you know? So, you know, right now we have something called Instant Karma. And what it does is that every time you use your debit card, so that's the money you have in your checking account. So you're not adding more debt on your credit card. We reward you. So by, we reward you by, randomly refunding that entire purchase. So you could be at that Starbucks wow. and you swipe your debit card and we could bring it right back. So that 10 bucks comes back or you're at the grocery store or your gas station um, or in your school library and your uh, um, bookstore and you swipe that. And so the idea is that we're, we're rewarding that right behavior 
um, so that you think about it that way and, you, and it motivates you to, to continue down that path, right? Yeah. Um, so those are the kinds of things we want to do. I think that's brilliant because I think this ne- this new generation Gen Z, which we'll talk about in a bit, because I yeah. know um, I, I read through the the study about Gen Z and what you all found. But I think that this particular generation, a lot of the data shows that they're more inclined to use debit and stay away from credit because they've seen the mistakes of previous generations when it comes to yes. taking on too much debt. And now yes. they're kind of like afraid, like they're like afraid of debt, like they're afraid 100%. of credit cards and student loans and all the things. Um, so yes. fi- me- meeting them where they are, like if, if their preference to pay for things is with the debit cards, now, okay, well, how can we incentivize them using that's those right. directly and give little rewards and incentives along the way? So, I mean, I think that's a great idea for th- particularly for this Gen Z generation, which is, you know, already really tapping into the debit card, um, you know, uh, method of, of paying for things versus credit cards, which I think millennials were very much, much more prone to use credit cards than debit. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So what about on the flip side? What is a time where <laughs> you spent a lot of money, but yeah. it was worth it for you and, and you don't regret it? Because I think that's one thing we don't talk about enough. Like people go like, oh, no, well, that was a lot of money. And well, sometimes it, it's worth it. Right. And, for, and that's kind of like a personal thing. But um, if there's something you can share where it's like, yeah, other people might think it was a lot, but it, it, you wouldn't change it because it was worth it for you. Well, I mean, um, I would say there's a couple of them. Right. So one is. I took out student loans, right, to to go to grad school, um, and it was it was a lot of money. Um, and um, you know, in when you when you look at it, and you're like, oh my god, there's like you know eighty thousand dollars of debt that you're just taking on, right? It's scary. Scary. Um, but you know, the way I thought about it was, it's an investment in my future, right? With that extra degree, it allows me to go into different kinds of uh, universities or, or different kinds of jobs and different kinds of roles. And it just built that confidence. And, you know, I, I was, you know, I did it early enough in my career, I did it in my twenties where I wasn't making that much money. Right. So the potential of jumping into giving me more options and more pay and more salary in the future with that degree totally paid off. Right. So that, and when I took it on, I was like, Oh my God, this is, I, how, what if I don't get a job? What if I want to quit? You know, how am I going to pay this off? But, you know, definitely worth the, worth the investment, I would say. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's interesting because the debate about the student loan crisis is just is yes. getting more and more, right, like out of hand where people are realizing like, yeah, we are in trillions of dollars of student loan debt. But I think that there's this misconception that, oh, it's a waste of money. And it is absolutely not. Like, I think we all agree that with more education, you're going to be much more prepared to, to excel in your career and your profession. But also when you look at the data around money, there's yeah. a direct correlation with higher yeah. education, more higher 100%. education. And, and uh, I think it's even up to like a million dollars more over the course of your life studies have shown, yeah. which is a big deal, especially for women and women of totally. color. And, and it you just know? gives you, so I would say, look, education is never wasted. If it builds that confidence, it gives you that more opportunities. You can raise your hand and say, I'm qualified to do this. You know, more power to you, right? You should, you should invest right. in, your, in your future. That's right. I, I think I love that point that you said where you have to be the one to raise your hand and say, I can do this job. Like, uh, you know, yes. put your name in the hat yeah. because if you have the degrees, but then you're not, you know, you stay in the entry level roles or in the mid management roles and you don't take on the challenge to really go to the, the, the higher level roles. Like that's where the money so is. True. That's where the challenge is. So like, true. The ch- and, you know, more and more, you know, when I'm now, you know, managing, uh, managing people. And one of the things when I interview women in particular, right, they will undersell themselves. You know, the guys yes. will be like, I haven't done it, but I know I can do it. I've di- I did this, you know, at a different, in a different way, but they will try to sell their experience as, as relevant. Whereas women are like, well, I didn't exactly do this. And so right. I may not be able to get, and I'm like, no, just step up. You will learn. That's, that's, that's what I'm so hiring true. you for. Right. That's so, so true. I think there's uh, even a study that I saw a while ago that said that men will look at a job description. And even if they only have about 30 to 40% of the qualifications, they will still apply. Whereas yes. women look at it and go, Oh, I, I don't even meet half or 60% of these qualifications. And it's like, yeah. what? You should still apply. Like, totally. No, be I, yeah. I only manage a 20 person team, not a 25 person team, or I don't have a degree or I never work yeah. in this area. And I'm like, doesn't matter. I, I, you know, you have enough skills and you have enough hunger to, right. to, to take it on. Right. Oh, I only have seven years, not 10 years. It's yes, like, wait, exactly. what? That's, that's a minor detail, minor that's right. detail. So <laughs> and I, I actually, think the only other thing is like when I build yeah. teams, I look for what I call cognitive diversity. So I want, um, we're building apps for everybody, right? We're building solutions for everybody. And we want to be able to say, 
you know, what would Yanelli's experience be versus an Eric's experience? You know, what would my experience be as an immigrant and so on? So that helps us build a much better product. Um, and so that's important for me to have that in my team as well. That's an excellent point. And I think that there are more and more managers that are prioritizing that because the data now shows that diversity of thought and experiences make a stronger team and make for stronger productivity. So I mean, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, so we were just talking about Gen Z a little bit, and I looked yeah. over the data. Uh, I know Qualtrics put out the study, but it was uh, commissioned by, by Credit Karma to really see, yes. hey, what's going on with Gen Z, right? Yeah. And so I, I, I looked over it, and I'm like, wow, this is so interesting. So they're going to TikTok and Instagram to get their financial advice, but the data actually, the study shows they're not just looking at it on there and like liking it and commenting on it. They're following the financial advice that they find on TikTok. So yes. that, that, can, that could be good. It could be bad. Tell us about... <laughs> The, the findings yeah. of, the, of the study. So, so really interesting, right? Like I said, this generation gets 52% off of their information from social media, right? And they're used to being interactive with it. Like, you know, I, I learned a lot from reading a website or a book or TV. So it's like a one-way communication. Whereas, you know, you, we see these uh, the, the new generation sort of really thinking about like, I want to have a comment. I want to hear what somebody else is saying. I want to be part of that discussion. And they're also looking at very authentic people, right? So they're not, they're, they want to, relate to the person, the influencer, um, the, the celebrity that's actually giving them that advice. Cause like, yeah, I think, I think you're on the level, right? Um, and so I wanna follow you. Um, and they're used to just more sources of information, right? You, you know, they talk to their parents, they talk to friends and family, they look at it online and they integrate all of that together um, and, and say, okay, well, I, I think this is what I wanna do. And I think, you know, um, what I've, I've found in just talking to uh, several of these, of these uh, folks who are now Credit Karma members is that um, they're actually much more savvy about money, right? This is the generation that grew up with the pandemic and their parents losing their jobs in their homes and, or racking up debt in the, um, in the recession. So they're very, very aware that, you know, the financial journey is going to be bumpy. So they're now thinking about how do I save for college? How do I save for a home? How do I get another gig economy job so I have a side hustle? Right. Mm -hmm. They're already at like 21, 22, 23. They're thinking about this stuff. And, you know, I remember when I was 20, when I was like graduated college, got a job, have a car set for life. Right. That was basically yeah. my my outlook in life. So so I'm very impressed with, with how they do it. Um, and I think, you know, these new mediums like TikTok and, and et cetera, which are interactive, is actually a great way to learn. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I agree. I think it has to be interactive in order for it to be a positive learning experience because yeah. for so long, traditional education platforms and learning experiences have been a one-way street. Like you said, it's just like you get the information, you input it, and you and you only you only output on the exam. Yes. <laughs> It, it does, it's not working. We can see that it doesn't work, right? Like yeah. we, ha we have to change it. And so I think social media is a great way to change that and also invite younger learners in. Um, yeah. I, I'm curious what you think, because I, I do feel like my personal opinion is that it's been the failure on the part of the school system, traditional school system to include oh, personal yeah. finance. And I'm like, if, if financial literacy and personal finance was a class in school, maybe the problem wouldn't be exacerbated to this point. Uh, totally. but, I, but I do think that it's, there's positives and negatives, but I wonder if you think it's maybe doing more harm than good, or if it's a greater benefit than it is harmful for young people to go on TikTok and go on Instagram and see things about, you know, their credit score or investing or, you know, yeah. bank accounts that they should consider. Because, you know, a lot of times they're in the report, I saw one of the things that stood out to me is it said 37% of them are taking the financial advice at face value and they're not yes. even double checking the information. Yeah. So that's, that's a risk, right? So I don't know. What, what do you think about like? No, it's a, it's a really good point. Yeah, and I think you know you have to you have to do your homework and trust the source and you know use places like Credit Karma, um, uh, in the credit report to really understand what's happening there, right? Um, and and so my 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 advice to you is you know these are great channels for you to understand what what is possible, but when you apply it, you want to apply it to your financial situation, right? So you want to be able to say, can I afford? to go off and you know buy cryptocurrency or go off and buy a share right today or should i be worried more about saving money so that i have enough for a student loan tomorrow right so i think there's there's that notion of it as well um, and then talking to the the adults in your family that you trust right i think that's another source as well um, yep. and and you know i think j just finding that information you know qualifying it and, and using it um, that's the best way to do it yeah i definitely agree i mean i remember 
you know, as a millennial, I feel like the, the big difference between millennials and Gen yeah. Z is the internet was always around for Gen Z. But for us, yes. like I, I remember kind of when it started and like, I remember like if you picked up the, the house phone, it would disconnect the dial up and you can get on the <laughs> internet at the same time. Like, yeah. Like that's a memory I have, right? Being in my thirties that I think that yeah. teenagers and, and young twenties don't have those memories. They don't, they didn't experience that. Yeah. Uh, and so they have this distinct experience where they grew up in a world where everybody has a mini computer in their pocket. Yeah. And I, you know, in my, in my mind, you would think, well, that could either lead to everybody constantly using the internet to double check and fact check things. Cause it's so easy or everybody over trusting that the everything data. on the internet is true right yeah, yeah. and the, yeah. and like like anything I oh I read it online so it must be true it must be true right yeah. um and and that's my note like trusted sources you know checking it up a couple of places talk yeah. to people in the real world right I think those are all good good ways to to validate yeah, definitely. And I mean, we're seeing that younger generations tend to be less likely to do it, but older generations do, you know, millennials, all the older Gen Z's yeah. are very much about fact checking and versus yeah. the younger are not so much into it just yet. But I think as you get a little older, you mature a bit, you realize that you need to be triangulating, right? Or you need to be, you know, kind of triangulating. Looking. That's the right word. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Because because I think fact checking, when we say like double check, that's like check one place, check another place. But triangulating yeah. is like, no, no, no. It's really like you need three sources. At yeah, least. Exactly. <laughs> that's very true. That's very true. <laughs> so so I, I wonder what like advice you might have for if you're a younger Gen Z and you're not doing that, yeah. right? You're not fact checking, yeah. you're not thinking, but you still have to make all these decisions about like, is it in your budget? What kind of bank yeah. account should you be having or apps should you download? Because there's so yeah. many fintech apps to choose from. Um, right. You know, in theory, it, it should be easier with all the technology and tools, but in practice, it can be a little overwhelming. Um, so yeah, what advice maybe for Gen Z specifically about getting on the right financial path? So I think the first one really is um, you know, identifying what your goals are, right? Whether you want to go to college or you want to, you know, save for a rainy day fund or you want to save for that PlayStation or whatever it is, like identify your goals, right? Separate your life into needs and wants and then long-term. So needs are, you got to pay your cell phone bill. You got to pay your credit card bill. Wants are these kinds of things. I want to save for that vacation. You know, I want to save for that PlayStation. And then finally is the long-term, like at some point I want to, go to college or I want to, you know, buy a new car or, or any of those things. So separate those. Um, and then really look for uh, fintechs and finance companies that help you support that, right? Uh, so one is, you know, nobody should ever charge you fees to get access to your own money, right? Yes. I think that's like Americans spend 35 billion in fees for just things like monthly fee, ATM fee, you know, lower deposit fee, overdraft fee, right? Yeah. So find, find, um, uh, places where you don't have to get, get fees, right? The second one I would say is, you know, automate your life, right? Automate is, automating is a new discipline. So let's say you get a, a, a source of, of money, you have an income that comes in every two weeks, segregate them into, and like just set up the automated schedule that says, I'm going to move, you know, a hundred dollars towards my cell phone plan. Just take it out. Like you don't even see it in your main checking account. It just goes away into your savings account. Same thing with your wants and your need and your, and your future goals, right? So if you set up that automation, then you're not tempted, right? To go off and, and like do the spending and, and so on. So, so think about it that way, just structure your life um, so that you have these like accounts that you're opening up um, that, that allow you to do that. So, you know, find, find uh, financial institutions that don't charge you fees, right? Make sure you have access to your money. Um, set up your life as much with as much automation as possible, so you're not having this financial anxiety. Like, will I be able to pay my bill while I want to go off with my friends and go eat at a restaurant? Right. So just That's make right. your life easier. Yeah. Yeah, so much easier. And I find that a lot of people don't realize when you're setting up your direct deposit, especially young people, because you know it's your yeah. first job. It's it might be the first time you're filling out an, a paper, you know, paperwork for HR where you have to fill out that direct deposit form. Right. People don't realize that you can put multiple bank accounts on that yes, direct deposit exactly. form. Yeah. That's an example of automating that, like what you said, which is where, yeah. you know, maybe 90% of my paycheck goes to my checking account, but 10% of it automatically goes to my savings account on yes. my payday. So yeah. I don't have to set up a recurring transaction for my checking account. It goes from my direct deposit. It goes into two accounts. Right. Uh, I, I, that's always, I, be, I think, been such a big tip that I, when I learned that, I was like, oh, wow. Like I did, I thought you had to put <laughs> one bank account on that form. Like that's genius, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Super and, helpful. Yeah. 
and and you know, open it online. So Credit Karma Money has a checking and a and a and a interest bearing savings account, right? So you can right. just do it right there. You can move money between the two right away. You set up that automation. Set up yeah. automated bill pay if you can as well, right? Because yes. then it's just it's just gone. And you never you're never late. It doesn't harm your credit. You don't have to pay late fees. Just set that up as well as part of that. Definitely, yeah, definitely. I I gotta say I upgraded to automatic bill pay. I mean, it, it took me a while because at first when I was trying to pay off debt, I was nervous to do it. Like, but what if I don't yeah. have enough for it? But I gotta say I did. I combined what you just said, which is I set up yeah. two different accounts. One of yeah. them was for my rent, my bills, my needs. The other account was for fun stuff. And so yeah. I didn't have to worry that my auto pay for my bills wasn't gonna go through because I knew that it was coming from the main account versus yeah. my second, my fun money, you know, checking account was isn't going to be set up on auto pay for anything that would be for me exactly to spend. Right. yeah so it makes it makes a lot of sense that way and it's just easier to sleep at night not worrying about not having enough money to cover bills yeah um, um, i think the last thing is you know if you can think about building credit in a safe way right so yeah. as you as you adult right it, it you know your first apartment your first cell phone your first car all of them require a credit score right oh. so start early and start um start building that it's true. I'm so nervous when I hear young people say, I'm not, I don't need a credit score. I'm just going to avoid credit. I don't want debt. Like, <laughs> yikes. You can't go to either extreme. You don't want to be in a That's tremendous right. amount of debt, but you don't want to have no credit either because you're just going to make your life hard either way. Like there's got to be, yeah. you know, a sweet, you know, place in that threshold right in between where you say, I'm going to build health, like healthy credit. And, yeah. and essentially what you're doing is just giving yourself a strong financial reputation so that if you, That's if right. and when you need to borrow, they're like, oh, okay, yeah, you look like a person that deserves, you know, and, and is credit worthy versus yeah. somebody who might look like a little sketchy, right? So that's really what it is. And I, I don't, I, I get afraid when I hear young people say that they're, you know, scared. I of want to credit. avoid they don't it. Want credit. Yeah. yeah, they just yeah. want to avoid it. I'm like, no, 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 you just got to do it the right way. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've spent a lot of time talking to women on the show because I, so yeah. I started the podcast in the middle of 2020 or like at the, right at the beginning of 2020, um, March women's history month, April was financial literacy awareness month. And I just wow. found like yeah. the podcast would be a great way to connect those two. So I want to talk to women yeah. and I want to have conversations about money. And I find that when we're talking about money in general, when you look for conversations about personal finance or business or economics, you know, women are underrepresented across the board. Like that is just a fact. And yeah. I wanted to, you know, overrepresent them to make up for that. So I was like, I'm only going to talk great. to women. Like I'm just going to have conversations. <laughs> and eventually, you know, I, I may open it up and have conversations with some young men as well. But I think that the key here is to really highlight like what are some specific challenges that young women face and that women face in their career trajectories, specifically yeah. when it comes to earning money, making money, making career moves. And then yeah. especially, I mean, I just think you're the perfect person to ask too, because you've, you've built, you've built a career in FinTech and, you know, you've kind of had so many different um, diverse experiences working for the government, working at all these different technology companies. And yeah. so I wonder what advice you might have for young women who are interested in, fintech and, and specifically if you're a woman of color because i think then you're even even less visibly represented in fintech um yeah. so what you know words of wisdom advice tips do you have for them to set themselves up to thrive in the fintech space yeah i think the you know the first thing is women actually run most of the households in america they manage the expenses they manage the day-to-day um, um and so you know don't count yourself up you you have real world experience right that's i think right. that's one I think the second thing we touched on, which is, you know, raise your hand, right? Don't count yourself out before you're out. Um, I think that's the other one. The third one is, and 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 we we don't we don't humble brag as much, I would say, right? So think about a way to represent what you've done with the data in, in a way that makes sense to you, that you're not sort of feeling like you're faking it, right? But be like, hey, I've done these things and here's the business impact. And just have that conversation with your manager because your manager is in more conversations than you are. And they can be like, oh yeah, you know, Paula me did this. I remember she said that and here's the impact. And so when there's a new opportunity, there's other people when you're not in the room who know what you do and what you're capable of and who can sponsor you and advocate for you, right? And the third one is look, hey, we don't do enough of this. You know, form a network, like what you're doing, right? Talk to, talk to other women who can be your sounding board, who can be like, girl, you should be doing that. Why aren't you doing that? What's wrong with you, right? <laughs> <laughs> so just have those. I have I have friends that, that do that to me, right? And they're just, yeah. well, aren't you? Wait, what is wrong? I know who you are. I know what you're capable of, right? Okay. Stop worrying about it, right? So having that sounding board 
And they may not be in the same industry, but they know you and they know your potential. And they're there to just be like super objective and honest about it. So I think those are the things that I've, I've le- learned and, and used. Yeah, I love that last one. I do think it's so important to have a girl gang that lifts you yeah. up. And, and also it's powerful because I, you, you say the name the names of other women when you get opportunities and then you bring them yeah. into new opportunities too. And, right. you know, I've, I've found that myself in the personal finance space that I'll get a, a you know, Instagram DM or an email yeah. from somebody saying, Hey, you know, I, I, saw, I met you at this conference for women where we talked about That's this right. panel. I think this, this would be great for you. Cause I can't make it to this event, but maybe you can do it. Totally. Instead. And I'm like, right. oh, wow, like, this is amazing. These girls are looking out yes. for me. Like, yeah. I love it, you know, yeah. Yeah. and you know, you're going to pay it forward as well. So it's not that, you know, you'll do the same for them. And so that's just, right. it's nice to bring everybody else along as well. That's, that's so true. I love that point. Um, I will definitely take a little soundbite of that one and post it on Instagram. It's a, great, it's a great one. It's a great one. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Polomi. To wrap up the conversation, I think I, I, I always like to kind of talk about money mantras or money messages because I feel like it's a great way to end on a note where it's hopeful, it's forward looking. It's like, look, we all have to spend money. We all have to make money decisions, right? It's, it, we yeah. can, it's, not, it's inevitable for us to you know, get to a point where we're, we're not going to have to use money. We have to use money all the time, every day, all, yeah. for all the things. Yeah. Um, and so the next time that you do go to make a financial choice or you know, think about how you're going to use your money, kind of keeping this money mantra in mind or this money message that will guide you. Um, it's kind of like a motto to help you think about how to wisely spend and, and make money choices that, you know, are going to be best for you. It might not be best for somebody else, but maybe, you know, yeah. because you have different priorities. So yeah. um, I, I like to just like take a little digital dollar bill and put this money mantra over it and post it on, on social media to promote the episode. Um, financial progress is a journey and you want to take one step every day, right? So don't think about the end goal. Don't think about, I, I, you know, I got to save for that college $80,000 loan. Think about what you can do today and take those, that step. And you always feel better when you take that extra step because you're moving towards your goal, right? So progress is a journey um, and you that. should take that step. Yeah. Financial progress is a journey. Love it. I love it. I, I mean, I do think we, we tend to, um, think constantly about the light at the end of the tunnel too. Like, okay, I just, yeah. I want to be, I just want to be there for you already. I just want it. I want that. <laughs> I want that. And it's good to let that guide you as your North star, but when you yes. overly obsess with it, you forget to celebrate the little wins along the way that are necessary to get you to exactly. that North star. Well, thank you so, so much for joining me. This was so wonderful. I can't wait to share this episode with everybody and to put the link to all of the data too, because I think that people need to see, you know, Gen Z is really on TikTok. They're on Instagram. They're really thinking about where they can go to talk about money since they're yeah. not learning about it in schools. So, <laughs> you know, we should we should be, you know, thinking about that and finding content uh, online and sharing it because they're already on there anyway. 100%. So as they're scrolling through the celebrity drama, they should be scrolling through financial tips <laughs> and tricks too, right? Like, why not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, follow follow Cardicama on TikTok and you'll get some good good advice as well. So. There you go. There you go. I will definitely link that in um, the show notes as well. So thank you so much, Paul. I mean, this was amazing. I'm so glad I got to have this conversation with you and uh, hope to have you back again soon on the show. Lovely. Thank you so much, Janelle. This was great for me as well. It was fun to talk about it. If you like this video, which I'm sure you did because the video was the bomb, then you're going to want to watch all the other episodes of the Mind Your Money with Miss Be Helpful podcast. And they're all right here in this playlist. So click the playlist to watch those episodes. And if you haven't subscribed to this YouTube channel yet, I don't know what you're waiting for. Click the subscribe button right now so you can get videos every single week and to join Team Be Helpful right here. That's all I have for you guys. Till next time, peace.